Good afternoon, everybody. We are delighted to welcome you to the fourth session of our MWF Live Speaker Series, where each week you'll be hearing from some of our Mandela Washington Fellows from summer 2018 about their passions and their mission and the excellent, impactful work that they're doing back in their home countries. I'd like to extend warm greetings to those of you who are here with us in person today at uh, beautiful Thomas Jefferson's Monticello in Charlottesville, Virginia, and also greetings to those of you who are joining us in a virtual capacity through Facebook Live. Welcome. The Presidential Precinct is a six-partner organization that includes the University of Virginia, William & Mary, Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, James Madison's Montpelier, James Monroe's Highland, and Morven Farm. And together our mission is to invest in inspiring visionary leaders to tackle some of the biggest challenges facing their countries and their communities. Today we'll be talking about the challenge, which is a common one across all countries, including our own, of protecting the rights of marginalized groups and communities. And we're really looking forward to hearing from our panelists um, about their experience and commitment to uh, working on that issue. I'd like to introduce our moderator. Today we're joined by Naya Bates, who is the public uh, public historian of slavery and African-American life here at the Thomas Jefferson Foundation at Monticello. And I also has a real passion for civil rights and community empowerment. So she is the perfect person to uh, moderate our panel today and to engage uh, with our participants and also with all of you. So thank you, Naya. Thank you, Nancy, for that introduction. So I want to start today by setting the stage. Uh, we're in a global moment where there are a lot of marginalized communities and there is a lot of activism happening all around the world. Uh, here in Charlottesville, for instance, we are in the process of memorializing a man who was lynched in 1898 on July 12th. His name is John Henry James. And there's a delegation from our city of a little over 100, 100 people uh, who are traveling to Montgomery, Alabama uh, to enter our soil into the National Memorial for Peace and Justice uh, that is part of the Equal Justice Initiative's uh, lynching uh, monument. And I want to start there. I mean, all. girls for disability inclusion, uh, poverty, hunger, and all sorts of issues that affect our society. Uh, so where we should start is having each panelist uh, introduce themselves, starting with Bon. Yeah, thank you. My name is Bon Fesmasa. I'm from Malawi, and I'm working on uh, human rights issues, uh, specifically focusing on the rights of persons with dis disabilities and inclusion. And I'm also working with the Association of Persons with Albinism in Malawi as the national coordinator. My name is Jacques Baeni. I'm a Congolese refugee in Malawi. I work with refugees on hunger and poverty. I empower women to income generation through rabbit farming. I also empower peer educators to raise awareness on sexual and gender-based violence. My name is Adrian Duko from Uganda. <coughs> I'm the founder and executive director of Human Rights Awareness and Promotion Forum, Uganda. We are a legal aid service provision organization. We also do legal advocacy for LGBT persons. We also do strategic litigation in favor of LGBT persons. We run the first and uh, the only specialized legal aid clinic for LGBT persons in Uganda. Thank you, everyone. Hi, Nai. Uh, my name is Aisha Tumanu. I'm from Cameroon. I work for two organizations, namely Lelewal, which I serve as the Gender and Advocacy Officer, and also uh, with Boskuda, which is a Bureau Social and Cultural Development Association, where I serve as a National Women Coordinator since 2014. Our main goal is to create awareness and protect the right of the vulnerable indigenous communities back home. So that is in brief what we do. but. Within the discussions, I'm going to highlight you on the details of what we do. Thank you. Great. So I'm looking around noticing, and everyone up here is young. You are part of this young leadership institute. Um, so what inspires you? Uh, what motivates you? Who do you look up to? Uh, this is for all of the panelists. OK. I will start by saying, firstly, um, I'm inspired by the indigenous women voices for which I work for and also for the young girls. Because today, you find the indigenous borough girls going to school, which is encouraging. Yeah, so. 
secondly, my mother inspired me because she was not educated, but she helped me to go to school. And she's a role model to me. So I always take her as an example. And I always encourage the other young girls to copy from me as well and to continue the fight for the right of the indigenous borough woman. Thank you, Ashati. Um, what inspires me um, is that person, that LGBT person that wakes up in the morning not knowing what is next for them. Today we've been uh, touring Monticello, the home of Thomas Jefferson. We've seen the history of slavery and what that means. And when I connect that to what people go through back home in Uganda when you are LGBTI, you basically don't exist. You have no existence. People don't see you. They don't know you exist. They don't know what you go through. They don't know what your life is about. You can't bring it out to the open because as soon as you do that, you're going to lose your humanity. You won't be human anymore. So those people live on every single day. I'm a privileged lawyer, so I can stand up. I can do what I want to do. But most of the people that I serve can't do that. And for me, the fact that they live on, the fact that they hope, the fact that they survive gets me to work every single day. Getting one of them out of jail, making sure that one law is challenged and one law is defeated makes me move on. And I look up to people who have done that. I know what can be done by someone else, I can do it. Some inspired by people have made change happen in their own countries. People like Nelson Mandela, people like Winnie Mandela, people like um, Martin Luther King Jr. and so many others, including many in my own country that have done a lot to change their own lives and those of others. Thank you, Adrian. I always dream a world without human rights abuse, a world in which men and women are participating to the development of their community. I'm inspired by Mahatma Gandhi, the father of Indian independence. He worked for uh, non-violent disobedience. He also promoted multiculturalism and re religious pluralism in India. Thank you. What inspires me is more of my, my parents as well. Uh, realizing the love that they showed me as, as a person with albinism, but also my sisters with albinism, that really inspires me a lot. And it, it explains why I should also love others, why I should be accepted in that particular society. So also working with families that have children with albinism or adults with albinism inspires me a lot because I know what it means to have uh, that condition. I know what it means to struggle in that condition. But important is I've also experienced those smiles as a person with albinism. So that's really pushed me to say I should also make people smile. I should also make people feel happy. Wonderful, thank you. So I want to follow up on something that uh, Adrian mentioned in his uh, statements here. So Adrian comes from a legal background, but I know that um, Ashatu also has some background uh, in legal work. So for the two of you, uh, how has that background in uh, law helped your community engagement work? And what have you taken from that into your communities? Thank you, Nia. Um, it has helped me a lot because it has helped me to understand the different international legal instruments that exist, uh, the national documents that exist with regard to constitution of our country. We have the UN Declaration on the Right of Indigenous People, and this document, this declaration, is something that if you have not been with the legal background, you will not understand. So this has enabled me to better understand those conventions, those treaties, the declarations, the uh, Declaration on Human Rights itself, and all those things have enabled me to understand them, interpret them, and put them in a lower and simplest way in order for me to transmit to my own people who are not, most of them who are not educated, so I have to translate those documents, those treaties, those conventions in the local language at times, and then try to simplify it in, in a way that they will better understand what their rights are all about. Because with this convention, with this the declaration, the UN DRIP, we are not asking for new rights, but they are just human rights, basic human rights, which are always violated. So we use, I use my legal background to interpret and also transmit to the others in order for them to better understand and defend themselves wherever needs be. As a lawyer, 
my experience with the law is usually one-sided. The law for me is how I think. The law is how I see things. Something is either illegal or legal. And that's problematic. We need to see the world beyond the dimensions of the law, of whether it's legal or illegal. And I'm trying to train myself to be much more human than whether something is legal or illegal. So for me, in my work, I use the law a lot because it helps me to, the law is clear on most things, as in discrimination is discrimination in the law. Of course, my, <clears throat> the courts back home have found a way of making sure that discrimination can be, can be legalized in certain circumstances and different ways. But for me, I think the law is key on certain things. Once you go to court, the judge has to hear you. The judge can't say, you are homosexual, I can't hear your case. The judge, the judge will hear you, regardless of what they think, and they will have to give you a judgment. And it has to be reasoned. What they give you as judgment has to be reasoned. For me, that's powerful, and that's why every day I think I can go to court and make a difference in people's lives. If a policeman arrests you because you are gay, and you know, the reason why they arrest you is because you are found walking like a gay person. I don't know how gay people walk, but maybe you guys know how they walk. But the police in Uganda seems to know how they walk. So they arrest you for walking like a gay person, and then they will arrest you, they do an annual examination on you to find out whether you are gay, to confirm whether you are gay or not, regardless of whether they have any, any, any indication that you had sex or not. And that dehumanizes you as a human being. But when the law, when you take them before the law, they have to answer for their own actions. We've taken quite a number of police officers to, to the police standards, professional standards unit in Uganda to make them answer for what they have done to LGBT persons. And in those, in those spaces, there's some sort of equality. The small person is also eventually standing up to this big policeman without a gun this time around because he's in the dock and you will start to discuss before the law. Beyond that, I try, I know what I do is so little to change the lives of people. I've come to understand that as a lawyer, if I see life through the perspectives of the law, what I'm doing is much less helpful to the person who, are, who doesn't have what to eat. You know, the idea of being gay, the idea of being marginalized is invisibility, as I said before. You disappear completely. Disappearance means you can't find a job. You can't walk as a human being, as a person. The first thing people see about you is sex. You know, you walk around and everyone is like homosexual, as if that's what defines you. Nothing else defines you except your homosexuality, and that means you're going to disappear and, and, and be nowhere. That means that you have to eat, you have to go to school, you have to work. All those things may be addressed by the law, but they may also not be addressed by the law. So I try to go beyond the law and do much more than simply what the autism. That's why for now at HIRAF, in Uganda, we are doing police trainings. We train and speak to police officers, not just on the law, but also on humanity. During those meetings, that's the first time that a policeman has interacted with a gay person. As in real interaction, that's the first time that happens. And every time we leave those meetings, the policemen give testimonies of what it means, of, of what, how they would start acting towards people, because they see that, okay, the person standing up in front of me is not a homosexual, it's a human being, regardless of what they do in bed or they don't do for that matter. So for me, that's how I use the law, both ways. And I think it's starting to work. Something is giving. We win cases in court, but we also lose. Like last, last week, we just lost one. We just lost a case on registration of sexual minorities in Uganda, uh, the network for LGBT organizations in Uganda. Despite the cases decided in Kenya and Botswana, saying that you can, LGBT organizations have to be registered, the Ugandan court said, well, this is not Botswana, this is not Kenya, this is Uganda, and we won't register you for being gay. That, again, makes people completely disappear. But we shall fight that. Sooner than later, we shall overturn that, and that will happen. So I hear you saying that we have to work outside of the law, right? Some of the worst atrocities in human history were legal. Slavery was legal. Segregation was legal. Apartheid was legal. Uh, and so I'm wondering, uh, this question is for Bon, uh, is there, are there legal hindrances for people with albinism uh, in your country? Or, or what is the cultural force that you're responding to in your work for the Association for Persons with Albinism and Disability Inclusion? Yeah, there, there are legal gaps uh, in, in, in general when we talk about the response towards the attacks on, cases, on persons with albinism. Just to say, much of our work as an association, we, we are working on the ending attacks. So in Africa, in, in my own country, people with albinism are being killed for ritual purposes. Uh, the latest case, just to report now, is the, it happened on the 6th of, 6th of June, July. And the, that boy, 12 years, was murdered by his own stepfather. And this is the reality of life. We have so many cases in Malawi. Uh, out of the 600 cases that have happened in Africa, 24% of those cases have happened in Malawi. And you could actually see the failure of our criminal justice system in Malawi. Out of those cases, none has been concluded. We have now, with this case that has happened, we have 23 murder cases, and none of those cases has gone to court. And this really shows 
the failure of our criminal justice system to address uh, the systematic stigma and discrimination that has always been there. The other thing is also to look at our own culture. We are looking at uh, parents that have never accepted us the way we are. We are looking at friends that have never accepted us. Even the police, they work with us, but they don't really understand who we are. And th these attitudes are cutting across. At policy level, at community level, we always face challenges when it comes to addressing uh, or providing support to persons with feminism. So, all in all, we are also having challenge a lot in terms of the victims. So we are looking at the people who are living in fear. We are looking at people who have been victimized, but the criminal justice system does not provide even psychosocial support to such families. So the majority of us, we are like living in trauma because there is no legal support that can, that can protect persons with urbanism. We have made some steps as a country. We have now worked with the parliament to do amendment of the penal code and the Anatomy Act, but we have also done uh, with the, the parliament developing a handbook that provide or stipulate penalties when people are found with body parts or bones of persons with urbanism or any tissue of person with albinism or any killing that we know is was the purpose was because that person had albinism. So there are some steps, but the huge gap is how do we want to implement those uh, tools, but also how do we want to address change over time because the fear is there in our society and in us as persons with albinism. Do the groups you're working to protect face violence? And this is for anyone. Violence. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> physical violence. Is there wow. a physical threat to the group you're working to protect? Every single day, every single night. Um, I, I will start, um, actually, be even beyond the, the groups that I work with, I will even start with ourselves who work with the groups, because then the stigma extends even to those who work with the groups. I always tell people that I work at an embassy, because my office is not a normal office. It's an office that is guarded by guns, by, by police, by private security guards, we have cameras, we have a dog, we have a high fence, we have barbed wire. The reason for this is because in May 26, 2016, that is two years ago, we were attacked at night and our guard was murdered. And then this year, in Feb, we were once again attacked and our guards were beaten to near death. And so every staff member at my organization thinks they're coming for us next. If you look at the, 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 the staff turnover we've had since Feb, because everyone is trying to be like, we are going to die from this place. Yeah, so that's what we face as lawyers working for LGBT people. Just getting a lawyer to work for me, for my organization, is not an easy thing. A staff member to actually come. Last time we did interview just before I came here, and people didn't turn up because they were like, okay, I now fully know what you do, and I can't take on that risk. Now, for my clients, just imagine it gets much worse. Every single day we have cases of violence against LGBT people. We document them, some never come through. People have been burnt. We, there, we had a case recently of two people being burnt with petrol by the community because they were gay. People have been dumped out, outside houses. People are, are, are beating their own children and throwing them out of their out, out of home. So violence for us is something that you expect, is something that you live with, is something that is part of your work, is something that is part of the lives of your clients. And the reason is simply because you are gay. And people just don't like you because you are gay. There's no other reason why people are going to beat you up except the fact that you are gay. Yeah, I think for me there is a threat because uh, my work is uh, I am a person with albinism and I need to defend my own rights. I also need to defend the rights of others. I have worked in a very terrible situation whereby we do postmortem when a body that has been chopped off and I'm there looking at that person and I'm in that state whereby I know it could be me in this state. And working with police officers, working with medical officers, uh, who have been involved in such cases becomes a serious threat. When you go into a government meeting, you are not so sure who is the buyer of this body, but so you, you, you even wonder where do I want to, to, to make my comments, but that makes us also my movement to be very sensitive to what do we want to say, whom are we meeting. Even in our homes, we don't just bring strangers. Most of my meetings, I do them in an open door. I make sure I inform my family because even this trauma goes back to my family. My wife has to know where I am, at what time, who are, whom am I meeting, which vehicle am I using. Even my workmates, they need to know all this because we're not so sure who is buying these body parts, who is behind these killings. So you would imagine somebody in the rural area. If this is happening for me, who is educated, who is living in the urban area, the rural area is the worst part for somebody to live in our society. So my next question is for Jack, and you're working also with LGBTQI uh, populations, and I'm wondering what your biggest challenges have been. 
Um, let me talk about the context of refugees. Uh, in Malawi, refugees are in a camp. They are not allowed to stay in city. Uh, they also, they are not allowed to have access to job opportunities. They can just work as volunteers. Uh, you can work with a Malawian in the same position. He will get a salary. They will give you something like a soap less than $100. So uh, they don't have other source of incomes that they can uh, use. Uh, they, they are in the camp, the UNSCR provide the humanitarian assistance, but it is not enough since it's only food and some non-food items. They can need like sugar, uh, body lesions, and other items. It is really challenging for them to have access to jo those job opportunities. Or what we can do is to see what we have, like a community resources, and how we can make a use of those community resources to uh, meet our needs. Certainly. And so you've been working a little bit on agricultural uh, income. Can you talk a little bit more about that and what it looks like? Yeah. It is in that way that we thought about uh, rabbit farming. Uh, I work with single mothers, widows, and women living with disability. We empower them to income generation. We identify them in the community. We give rabbits so that they can raise those rabbits in order to meet their family needs. Uh, why we chose rabbit? Because we know that the rabbit has a faster multiplication. Every month, a rabbit can give birth. And when it gives birth, it is easy for those uh, people to sell the rabbit and meet some of their family needs. And rabbits, they also use ma uh, rabbit manure for their garden. Uh, that is another way which can also help them. If they don't have uh, gardens, they can sell those rabbit manure. Rabbits are easy to feed and housing is also easy. Uh, before we give them those rabbits, we train them to rabbit farming, how they can feed rabbits, how they can take care of rabbits. And it is in this way that we help a refugee to become self-reliant, to become a part of the solution to their daily problems. Ashatu, you're also working on income generating activities for women and girls. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, the strategies you're using? Yeah, uh, we, do, uh, we do work on income generating activities for women, especially because we feel like if a woman has to be independent, she must be at autonomous, like economically empowered. So what we do, we do like training workshops whereby we, we, we buy machines, sewing machines, we provide to them. We train them, and then at the end of the day, we give them those machines. They use them to generate incomes and sustain their families. That's one of the things we do. Another thing that we do is dairy farming, whereby being uh, from a pastoralist community, we, we, re, uh, we, we have uh, cattle, so we, transform, uh, we encourage the women to transform the milk into edible items, such as the yogurt and the cheese that they can sell in order to generate money. We also do, um, we, we provide them with micro loans in order to have petty businesses around them to sustain their lives, improve their, their well-being, and also cater for their children. Because we feel like if a woman is economically independent, she can also contribute and help the husband who is also somehow you know, in need of that. So those are some of the things that we do. We also do adult literacy programs for women who are not educated because most of them are highly illiterate. So we do adult literacy program in order to empower them so that if they go to the hospital, they will not face challenges because at times they will go to the hospital, there is language barrier and then they cannot even read and write. So it's so challenging for them. So we do that in order for them to at least understand how to read and write their names firstly and then try to understand with the medical doctor in which they will collaborate. So those are some of the things that we do. Wonderful. So you've all mentioned uh, the things that have brought you success in some way, but I kind of want you to list uh, what have been your best strategies for protecting the communities you work with. Uh, we heard a little about uh, utilizing the law, about um, encouraging sustainable agriculture and self-empowerment, uh, working with the communities to organize, but what have been your, your biggest wins, I guess, in the, in the fight that you're fighting? 
my biggest win. Uh, I don't know how to start it, but <laughs> yeah, we have got a lot of successes. Um, today, we, 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 you will find like many Boro girls educated because Boskuda will provide to them uh, scholarships in order to help them go to school. That is one thing. Secondly, uh, with the women who are empowered economically, they also contribute to the well-being of this community as a, uh, as a community and also in the development of the country as a country. So we, we tell them um, these are some of the things you have to know and this is how you go about it. So what we do, we do outreach, we do a lot of outreach, we do uh, training workshops, we build their capacities on leadership skills, management, uh, we also do um, uh, like focused group discussions in order to better understand what are some of their issues and how we can tackle them. What else do we do? We do um, documentaries whereby we talk about the history of the people, the oral history, because it's not written. So that is one of the things I'm doing. I'm doing documentaries on who are the indigenous people and how we can document and preserve it for future generations. Another thing that we do, we use the media to create awareness for people to better understand who are indigenous people and how their rights can be uh, 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 respected. Another thing that we do is we, we, try to, we try to collaborate with other organizations in order to have more tools that will enable us to better continue what we are doing because training those youths and empowering them is a big challenge. We are not in a particular area within the country. We are in all the 10 regions of the country. And Buscuda has regional offices, and each region has its specific challenges. So we, we cannot, like at the national level, say this is what we are going to do to all the regions. No. We have to look at the specificities, specificities of each region and then go in line with what they need. So that is, in one way, what we do. Um. My wins, <laughs> that's an interesting word. When you look at, uh, at the law and whether you've won or lost is uh, quite a difficult question. But um, in terms of our strategy litigation, I think that's where we've had our biggest wins, but also our biggest losses. Uh, one thing I'm proud of is um, the fact that we defeated two laws. One is the Anti-Homosexuality Act. 2014, that's the law that proposed the death penalty for aggravated homosexuality, which basically meant touching someone <laughs> with the intent to commit homosexuality more than once. You know, touching someone with the intent to commit homosexuality. They had a way to define that, but those, that, those were some of the acts that were criminalized under that law. So that law uh, was tabled in 2009, and we won, we defeated it in the Constitutional Court of Uganda in 2014. I was coordinating the legal efforts that led to the nullification of that law. When that law went away, at least people could breathe a bit, though like uh, I will say later, that's also one thing that caused backlash in the community, lead to much more suffering for LGBT people, and also uh, leading to people thinking that there are no more issues in Uganda. The second law that we've defeated is the Equal Opportunities Commission Act. Someone will be asking, Equal Opportunities Commission Act, why would you, what's wrong with that? It had a provision. So the provision is section 1560D, which stated that uh, the commission, that's the Equal Opportunities Commission, will not investigate any matters regarded as immoral and unacceptable by the majority. So that was my first case as a lawyer. It's called Duco Adrian versus Saturn It's a 2009 case. We filed it on 1st of January 2009 when I was just leaving law school. And believe me or not, I got the judgment in 2016 in November, but I had won. <laughs> After eight or six years, we had won, and the judgment was, the judges said, well, if you, if you prevent one, pro, one part of the population from accessing a commission which is supposed to be an equal opportunities commission, then you are defeating the right to a fair trial. That was a big victory, and that means that right now, LGBT people can access the courts the way that they would want. We've also done eight cases in nine years. My organization is now 10 years, but to us together with the legal, with the civil society coalition on human rights and constitutional law and the LGBT groups in Uganda, we've done nine cases in almost nine years. We've won half of those lost the other half. And I can see the wins were all before, and the, vict the wins were before, um, like before, 20, at, around 2014, and we're now having losses, back-to-back -back losses happening, which leads to the question of backlash, which they know very well here. We also did, we are first group to go to the East African Court of Justice on LGBT issues, and it is the first case 
in the whole, East Africa, in the whole African regional system on LGBT rights, which is Human Rights Awareness and Promotion Forum versus Attorney General, which is the case we filed challenging the passing of that Administrative Act at the East African level. And, um, and, and uh, we've, we've, we've won a few cases which are about, you can't beat an LGBT person, you can't enter to their houses without respecting their privacy, you can't simply arrest them because they're LGBT. However, the losses, which is, what, which is the inverse of, of, of the wins, are problematic. The first loss is uh, called the Lokodo case, where the minister, minister of ethics and integrity, a reverend father walked into a room where LGBT people were, people were having a training and stopped the training himself. So we took him to court, the Attorney General and himself, and demanded that um, this be declared unconstitutional because it's violating the right to freedom of assembly and association. The court said, well, what the minister did was right because he has to protect the public interest. And in public interest, if you're having a meeting, talk about homosexuality, you're promoting homosexuality, which is a criminal act in Uganda. So we went, now we went on appeal, and the appeal is still pending. We went for the case, of, uh, the case about, the, the, about the registry of, of an organization, which we've also lost, with the judge quoting the earlier case, and saying that because of that case, you guys can never get registered. So now it has become an uphill struggle to move forward. Even after we had the anti Security Act defeated, we now have an uphill battle to make sure that actual LGBT rights are still protected in the country. But for me, I think one of the other biggest things is empowering the people themselves, LGBT groups. We do paralegal trainings. We've trained seven, I was checking last night, 76 paralegals, individuals in the LGBT community who are given basic skills in the law. And so they know how, what to do and how to protect themselves and how to, how to use the law to get their own rights. Because we are very few lawyers, we are less than 10 lawyers, and we can't do that for the whole country. But we train people, even in the rural areas, and they can protect themselves, they can defend themselves, and, and then defend their community members. For me, I think that's more empowering than even the legal victories in court, because the legal victories somehow don't trickle down to the people, and they cause more backlash. But the fact that you're empowered enough to do this on your own, for me, that's something. <coughs> yeah, my area of success, I can say, it's the refugees' participation to the uh, to, to solve their problems. Uh, previously, refugees were just in the camp waiting like victims for the humanitarian assistance. They provide to them bottles, that, like, uh, but they just wait for people to come and clean those bottles for them. They are, they are waiting for food distribution. They can't w look for other ways of working of, and struggling against their problem. But actually, you can see uh, many refugees, they are becoming more entrepreneurs because uh, they, 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 they have understood that it is now their responsibility to take care of themselves, and no one can take care of them 100%. Uh, that is an area of success. And another one, um, yeah. Let's talk about this community participation because they are uh, participating in all areas. The, the other one I would like to say, hmm. uh, I learned to use small things to make a big impact. We don't have external support to help refugees, but when we use those small resources that we have and make a big impact, that is another area of success. And one quick question before we move on. Uh, what are the refugees fleeing, right? What has brought them to Malawi? Why are they in the camp instead of in their home countries? Yeah, ref a refugee is someone who fled his country uh, for fear of persecution. That is the main reason. No one fled uh, just because there is war because there is hunger or something else or natural disaster, but each and everyone has a special case uh, for, uh, for what he fled from his home country. Uh, we are always, uh, it is always better to stay home, but when someone decides to leave home and go to another country, it means that there is something which is wrong. It means that there is a life which is at risk. Thank you. Thank you. For me, my win is the, to, because I've been in the movement for over 15 years. One thing that I've seen greater changing is the issues of uh, previously we had what we call self stigma. That has really reduced amongst persons in fabulism themselves. We are able to interact, we are able to, to discuss issues. 
and then move forward. The other thing is an issue of uh, the movement has really grown very fast. Uh, and I'm very much sure that even if I'm not in the movement, but we have young people who are now standing for themselves, championing their own rights. We have parents of children with urbanism who are now joining our movement and supporting our core at policy level, at community level. So the voice and the visibility of persons with urbanism in Malawi, it's really something that I feel we have successfully achieved. I know there are still some gaps, but the fact that we are there, our voice is there, I have reached uh, to an extent of sometimes you just go to the meeting, even if you don't speak, but the, your presence in that meeting, people still realize that there's a person with urbanism, any decision that we need to do now, we need to consider these people. That really me means a lot for me as a person with urbanism, but even for those people in their communities, when they're in the community meetings and someone will say, okay, let's consider this group. It's, it's an achievement that I feel it's more sustainable but also is helping people to change their own attitudes, but also helping the society around them to accept them the way they are. Thank you. In addition to successes, um, I would just want to say uh, the UN declaration, the United Nations Declaration on the Right of Indigenous People was adopted in 2007 at the UN headquarters, and our country is signatory to this, so we use this as one of our success because we use this tool to say this is our declaration, you must respect our rights wherever we are. Another thing is with regard to climate change, the red process in Cameroon, indigenous people have been considered a lot. We have a special panel where we bring our ideas and the ideas are being considered by the government. So in line with the government, they really collaborate with us hand in gloves in order for our rights and our views to be taken into consideration. So I would say at first, before the creation of our organization in 92, Bururu people were not having any voice in Cameroon. But today, you find Bururu people speaking, not just within their own communities, but at the national level. We, we have an alternate senator right now at the parliament, which is something for us, it's already an achievement. We also have uh, growing elites within the government space and it's already a success for us. So we think that if we continue creating that awareness, then our, our problems, our issues will be heard, not just at the national level, but also at the international level. Thank you very much. Okay, maybe just um, again, because of what you said, I forgot something. We also stopped them. And they're going to ask me who are them. American evangelicals coming to Uganda to spread hate. How did we stop them? We came to Massachusetts and found a case against one of them, Scott Lively, who is running for governor or something in Massachusetts. And uh, though we lost the case, but the cause wasn't lost. So we are helped by American lawyers, the Center for, for Constitutional Rights, and the argument was that you can't come from Uganda and import hate. So it was brought under the alien, alien statute, alien tort statute, which allows American citizens to be sued in America for what they do outside of America. That's a very good jurisdiction, and we used it. However, we lost because there wasn't enough connection between what he did on American soil. But the judge made it clear that if you stand in America, if, but that what he did, that is uh, supporting the passage of the Administrative Act and helping all those people who are supporting it in Uganda, that amounted to persecution of LGBT persons. What you've seen is that American evangelicals no longer come and do mega rallies against homosexuality in my country. So for us, that's a big win. Even if we didn't win in court, but we still won because now they know. If they do it anymore, we shall hunt them in America. You can imagine, we come for them here. <laughs> I think you're making a good point about partners uh, as well. And I want to hear who you're working with, who supports you. Is it just members of the community or are you seeing support from outside organizations, United Nations? I mean, where does your support come from? I would say the past few years have also been the years of LGBT rights. So we've benefited from that, the wave of LGBT, of LGBT support in, uh, in, first of all, internationally, but generally I would say from the US. During the reign of President Obama, um, the eight years of President Obama, I think we benefited a lot from that, with a lot of support coming in from the US government. Right now, 
I wouldn't be saying the same. I wouldn't say the same thing about support from the US. But President Obama's regime, yes, we got a lot in terms of support, in terms of guidance. We came and, uh, and spoke to people, and then they will be able to, inf to, to influence and guide how we go about things um, back home in Uganda. But also not just the, the, the government, but also the people, the organizations working best, from, best in the US helped us a lot in terms of the cases, in terms of funding and facilitating our work, in terms of advice. We had lawyers coming over to help us uh, do all the cases that we've done. So American support support was a lot, but also support at the UN Human Rights Council. We used to go to the UN Human Rights Council and speak out. When Uganda had the Human Rights Bill, the whole world, at least by the whole world, in this case I mean most of the Western world, was against the bill. And they used to give all this support, and that was important back home. Because I can assure you, the government of Uganda doesn't care what I think or what my fellow citizens think. But the government of Uganda once in a while cares what foreigners think which is absurd because I think they're supposed to pay attention to us more than they pay to foreigners, but they do pay attention to foreigners more than they pay to us. So we also have civil society support, a bit of it in Uganda, within Uganda itself, which is something that is important in terms of making things move, but not a lot again. So most of our support comes from uh, this part of the world. Thank you, uh, Nia. Uh, with regard to partners, we have local and international partners. Uh, locally, I will talk of the councils, we have also the government, whereby we have special ministry in charge of indigenous issues, which is the Ministry of Social Affairs back home. We also have the Ministry of Youth that we collaborate with. We have the Ministry of Women Empowerment. We have the Ministry of Territorial Administration with regard to citizenship, because our people living in remote areas, they give birth to their children back home, and their children are not registered. So today, we collaborate with them in order to register our children. Thirdly, uh, we, 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 we partner with religious leaders as well because it's very crucial with regard to early and forced marriages for young girls. We feel that uh, if those practices are there, so we need to talk with the religious leaders in order for the community to better listen to them and then understand the impact of the negative impact of those practices. So we also collaborate with traditional rulers among the, the, the communities. We collaborate with indigenous organizations both at the national and international level. We have a lot of networks. At the regional level, like in Africa, we have IPAC, which is a very big network of indigenous organizations. We partner also with um, international UN agencies, for instance, because we know we fought for our elders, fought for the declaration to come out, and today the UN can, you know, accept indigenous people with their lifestyles, with their dressing code in the UN headquarters, and we express our voices, and our voices are being heard. So we, we partner with UN agencies, we partner with individuals who are interested in our cause, because we feel like if you are for the cause of the indigenous people, we can partner with you. So we partner with all those people, and yeah. Uh, when I founded uh, Vijana Africa Organization in 2015, uh, we didn't have any partner, but as I have said, we work using community resources. There are some organizations uh, which work with refugees. There is Jesuit Worldwide Learning. Uh, they provide us with some support. I started a videography class without having cameras, without having computers but they gave us a room where we had access to cameras and to computers before we got our own. And there is also the UNHCR. They, this year, they provided uh, some grant opportunities and I and Vijana Africa Organization, we won a grant this year. Uh, apart from that, this Jesuit Worldwide Learning provide education to people uh, I was educated there. When I came to Malawi, I couldn't speak English. My integration was not easy, but I had access to Regis University uh, through Jesuit Worldwide Learning, and my court is going to graduate on July 20. Uh, this is another opportunity that they provide. This partnership that we build in the community is empowering us, and we are trying to do something great. Uh, my participation to this Mandela Washington Fellowship is uh, a, a fruit of this partnership that we have in the community.
Yeah, thank you. We partner with different organizations. We currently are working with the Open Society Foundation of Southern Africa. We are working with Disability Rights Foundation. Uh, we have partnership with Feminist International and several others. And we work also closely with our government just to make sure that we move things internally as a country, but also uh, our communities. We have got good, com I mean, good collaboration. Many of the chiefs where we're trying to set what we call uh, urbanism champions. So these are the people that we would want to use them a lot to advocate for the rights of persons with urbanism in their own communities. Thank Great. So we're coming up on the end of our panel, and I want to ask one final question of everyone uh, before we open up the floor for questions. And I've got a couple questions here uh, from our friends online. But this next question, um, think what is what is one piece of advice that you have for uh, younger people who are looking to become activists, uh, for people who are looking up to you all? I mean, you all mentioned people that you look up to, Winnie Mandela, Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, uh, all of these great leaders, but what is your piece of advice as a leader to people looking up to you? Yeah, f for me, I think is the, as, as a person, I need to be very focused, and the people around me who are my followers also need to have that trust in me. So the first thing is to know your vision, know your goal, but also important is the, you must be able to listen to those people around you, because they always give good advice, they always give you the best direction to achieve your goal? Um, the piece of advice that I can give is first to have a clear vision. When you have a clear vision, that vision will give you a behavior. And in addition to that, you don't want uh, for anything to start. Start with the small resources that you have. Because if you don't start, you will never start because you will not get all the resources that you need at the same time. If you believe it, do it. Never give up. Learn to be focused. And then you must know what you want and how you should go about it. And then you should be determined, creative. And as well, we should know that there is nothing good that come easy in life. We must struggle to achieve what we want to achieve. Let's have a round of applause for our panelists. You guys are brilliant. <laughs> and now we have some questions that have come in uh, through Facebook. So this question is from Listel in Nicaragua. Uh, how do you involve your families in your fight for human rights? I would take the lead. <laughs> well, I, as, I, as I earlier mentioned, my mother is a role model to me because when I was going to school, um, I was the first Bororo girl to enter into Form 1, that is the college in my locality. And for me to go to that school, the governor of that place have to sign a letter to allow me to go to school without cutting down my hair. That was a big challenge for me. When I arrived in school, people were like, why is she special? And I was always discriminated by my friends. And I said to myself, I must go to this school and I must come out with something. So when I would go back home, my father who is educated would say, I encourage you. My mother who was helping me with my homework back home, even though she was not educated, would support me. And that pushed me and up till date, those are the people that have really made me to continue the struggle and fight for my community. Thank you. For me, um, my wife fully understands what I do. She shares my conviction and the work, and so that's not a, a big issue. The big issue maybe is with my boys. They are still young, so I shelter them. I keep them away from the public eye. I keep them away from the work until they are old enough to understand why we do what we do and how we have to do it. Um, when I started or when I founded Vijana Africa organization, many people joined. They thought that we are going to get financial support from different donors. But when they saw that we don't have nothing, they ran away. I got the support of my wife. Now we are still working together. I'm here, but today my wife held a meeting 
uh, in Malawi with my organization. She's always supporting me. And the values that I have, I always inspire them to my daughter and my son. Yeah, for me, my, my, my tool has been <coughs> building the vision in them. Uh, mainly my wife and, and my, my direct relatives, because uh, I'm working in a field where I don't trust anyone. So it's very difficult. Uh, I have had cases where my brothers and sisters have killed their own brother with albinism, or a, a parent has killed his own son with albinism. So I'm very sensitive, but I'm very sure I give my wife, my parents, and what exactly I want to do and where I want to be at that particular time. So give them that vision and build that trust in them. And I make sure I inform them that they don't even need to get that information to other people. So it's like I have really limited space and levels of trust in my work. Uh, the next question is for Adrian. Uh, what do Ugandans who have long fled their country expect upon considering moving back home? Uh, is there safety guaranteed? Those who have fled to their country. Well, that's, that's a tough one. I wouldn't want Ugandans to flee the country, but um, that has been happening. That's the other, what they call it, the other refugee crisis in Uganda. Since the law was passed in 2014, the Democratic Act, many people fled the country. Even if managed to defeat the law in two months, that didn't stop people from leaving the country. Because one of the contradictions is that when we had the law defeated, it simply increased violence and persecution of LGBT persons. That's why I said maybe it's not a win, because once we had it defeated, then people were like, okay, if the law can't work, then we are going to take this on their hands, so in our hands, and, and do something against LGBT people. So the violence increased, and every single year we see increased levels of violence against LGBT people. That forces people to run and be in, in, in conditions that are really terrible in the camps in Kakuma, in Kenya, and then to other countries. So when you return, Unless you are going to denounce your sexual orientation, which is not something that someone should do, that becomes quite problematic. Of course, most Ugandans will say, no, there's nothing that happens to LGBT people. Most meetings I go to people tell me, no, you've got, LGBT Ugandans are perfect, you're okay. And I ask them, how many do you know? Oh, no one, but I think they are fine. It's because you don't know them. It doesn't mean something is not happening just because you don't know it. But a lot is happening, and once you, you open right out there, you transcend that you are gay, certainly you're going to face it rough. All right, and I have another question about refugees, and this question is for Jack. Uh, should refugees as a marginalized group be allowed to work? Uh, doesn't that th make them more susceptible to a lack of privacy, to security issues? Yeah, the, the fact that they are not allowed to work, it's really exposed them to different issues, and like uh, prostitution in the camp, like uh, robbery and different, but we are trying our best because the law is there, the police is there, they can't do anything. Uh, uh, it's, it's like uh, uh, the, the, those who can violate the law, they are very, very uh, a, a small group, but refugees are full of skills. Refugees are full of talent. Refugees, they have knowledge. They are there, they are entrepreneurs, they are doing something to help them. They even help some or members of the host, host communities. Uh, do we have any questions in the room? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you're doing in your respective countries. It's really inspiring. My question is for Bonfit. I would like to know to what extent the new conceptions around traditional medicine contribute to the danger um, surrounding people living with Calvinism. And in your answer, can you please tell me whether you work with traditional leaders in your outreach and um, awareness campaign? Yeah, no, thank you. It, it does. There is a, a connection because uh, we work with traditional healers, it, but casually you, you find it is just the most difficult part for us to engage them. But we try as an association, but when we take that message out to the community, then the community often react differently because there's a strong link that uh, most traditional healers are the ones buying the body parts. And even in Malawi, we have cases whereby the traditional healer healers have been physically being involved in most of the murder cases and across African countries. So it's challenging. We're trying also to address it at legal, at policy level in terms of the Wishcraft Act that Malawi is trying to work around so that we, in a way, legalize uh, the practices of the witch doctors. The other thing is even how do we define who is a witch doctor, who is a traditional healer? That's also challenging in our context and there's a lot of work that we are currently doing to, to to really define who is a traditional healer. Because most people whom 
uh, the Minister of Health is already working with, they don't agree that they are traditional healers or that tra traditional, I mean, they are witch doctors. They always defend that they just help people using herbs. So they are more of like herbalists rather than uh, witch doctors. So it becomes so complicated because they don't accept that they are witch doctors. In Cameroon, uh, within the preamble of our constitution, it is clearly stated who are indigenous people, and it is defined. So indigenous people is a way of life, different from the others. Because as pastoralists, we still move from one area to the other. That defines us, and that is our identity. Self-determination is one of the criteria as well. So um, we will not say indigenous is minority but they are interlinked in one way or the other because we are still minorities because wherever we are, we are always the minorities in that particular area. But indigenous is a way of life, the way you feel like your identity, your self-determination, that is what we characterize as indigenous people. So I don't know whether I've responded to your question. Okay. There was a question in the back. Thank you. Um, I would describe myself as a poverty lawyer. Uh, that is, I work on issues of poverty, and that is marginalization that goes to people who are not seen as people. That is, uh, we do sex workers. We do legal aid for sex workers. We do legal aid for women who have had abortions. We do legal aid for drug users. We do legal aid for women living with HIV AIDS and women in rural areas. So those are the categories that we cover broadly in my organization, but basically because of the political issues surrounding LGBT rights, 80% of my work is basically LGBT rights. But we do also the other aspects of poverty. For example, we are going to court to challenge the petty, petty offenses, vagrous offenses, that is uh, being rogue and vagabond, uh, being idle and disorderly. So we want to go to court by the end of this year to challenge those. They affect LGBT people, but also they simply criminalize poverty. All right, we are out of time. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for tuning in online and check out the next NWF Live uh, forum, but a round of applause.